Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Genre Equality Podcast. I'm Hit Zero. I'm Isa. Uh, we have lots to talk about this month. Um, some big news in Singapore. Our cinemas are open. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> we are still like social distanced. We are seated like two seats away and everything. But we have our movie theaters up and running, which is more than we can say for America, I guess. Um, so in the next couple of months, uh, it, General Equality is in a weird position to be reviewing <laughs> some big uh, American movies that would not be coming out in America. Um, as well as big international movies, like for example, Train to Busan Peninsula, which we'll be talking about this month. Uh, and you know, Tenet is coming out next month. Um, Mulan and, and things like that will be in a quiet place too, will be coming out in the coming months. So do keep a look out for that, like, because I think we will be one of the first uh, few places in the world, or, or in at least in the podcast space, to be reviewing things like that. Um, but there's more than on-screen stuff, you know. Uh, yep. We'll be talking about the Sandman audiobook. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, Netflix's uh, Japan Sinks 2020, which is the latest adaptation of that famous disaster novel. Uh, I think there have been other adaptations made as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be talking about the American TV adaptation of uh, Snowpiercer, uh, which was made famous by Bong Joon-ho, of course, but it was originally a French comic book. Um, we'll be talking about a, a time loop comedy, uh, Palm Springs, uh, some very violent uh, immortal mercenaries in uh, The Old Guard, uh, which was written by Greg Rucker, who I really love as a comic book writer, and, and lots of other things as well. Like, there's lots of anime, there's lots of stuff on Korea. A uh, very Asian-centric kind of uh, podcast we have this month, uh, which, which, you know, is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I guess we should begin with the biggest, uh, quote-unquote, like, in terms of like hype, right? Yeah, the, the, sure. the the biggest topic that we have to talk about, and it will be our first topic, is um, the sequel to Train to Busan. It's entitled Peninsula. It was originally just titled Peninsula, but I guess the studio execs made the wise call to add the Train to Busan in front to remind people that this is a Train to Busan sequel, yeah. You know, yeah. since it was such a blockbuster hit. Uh, but this is once again directed by Yang Yuan Sangho. Uh, this sequel kind of uh, ups the ante and moves the action forward. Uh, to a post-apocalyptic and quarantined uh, Korean peninsula, uh, quite timely, which has been ravaged by the zombie outbreak. It's set four years after South Korea's total decimation, as we see, as we watched in the first movie. Uh, we follow a new character named uh, Jang Seok, a soldier who previously un escaped the undead wasteland. Um, however, he is compelled to return by Hong Kong gangsters um, to carry out a dangerous mission, which involves locating... Uh, an abandoned truck uh, with bags full of cash and bringing it back to Hong Kong. Essentially kind of a high zombie hybrid uh, when his team <laughs> um, unexpectedly stumbles upon survivors, you know, both good survivors and bad survivors. Uh, things get complicated as we see uh, what life is like in, uh, in a post-zombie apocalypse. Uh, Busa uh, not Busan, in Korea in general, you know, the entire Korean peninsula. So um, what do you think about the, the Train to Busan sequel peninsula? Uh, I, I thought it was good. Uh, it mm. wasn't. Uh, I I don't think it was as great as the original movie, right? Mm. Um, just because there were certain elements I felt that were a bit lacking. Uh, in terms yep. of like the kind of like the characters that we got, the kind of like villains that we got. Um, it was fun overall. Definitely, I had a. It was a wow ride. I enjoyed um a lot of it. Uh, but just generally, it didn't feel quite as polished, I guess, or quite yeah. as well told as the original Train to Busan. Yeah, I guess much like Train to Busan, the the plot is kind of deliberately straightforward. It allows viewers to kind of more more focus on the on the jaw dropping set pieces that uh that um the director wants to include. Um, this includes like a few. I have to say, like uh, I have some qualms with the movie, but there are a few extraordinary car chases. Uh, -huh. uh that goes just full throttle on the streets of Seoul. Uh, very uh Fury Road esque sequences that kind of just blew me away. Mm -hmm. Uh, what works particularly well. Is uh in, is the more ambitious visuals uh not just in terms of cinematography but in terms of the work done post production yeah. which kind of reflects the director's uh, skills uh, more as an animator than as a filmmaker uh, because yeah. a lot of the sequences are, are pure CGI um so instead of striving for realism uh, a lot of it feels more more like a video game or an anime um kind of similar to the anime prequel that uh that's um 
the director did uh, prior to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I kind of mean that in the best way possible, like, in terms of excitement and exhilaration. Uh, but where it doesn't work for me, though, is, is kind of the, the excessive uh, K-drama, uh, <laughs> esque um, melodrama, like, basically. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, you know, slow-mo crying to piano music, and it gets a bit much at times. Uh, the acting is okay. Yeah. Uh, with the lead actor being especially one note, probably the weakest uh, member of the cast, which is yeah. uh, which is unfortunate uh, because you know he is the lead, right? Yeah. Um, the characters are also all very um, lazily defined archetypes, especially the villains. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, the story beats are pretty predictable. Um, the film, like on a bright spot, the film does kind of address some time timely notes of. Uh, like xenophobia that happens in the case of a pandemic when we yep. see uh, Korean refugees in Hong Kong being feared and treated like second-class citizens. However, things like that are kind of just touched upon without actually exploring them. And I think like that's kind of an avenue that you could have made a sequel on. Yeah. You know, but like, well, kill uh, But they just touched it and then never came back. Yeah, um, it was just part of a plot point. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, like, what, what, do, what do you think about the characters and story? I mean, like you said, like they're really quite two D, right? Like mm. honestly, one of the uh, if uh, the our, our main protagonist stands to win an award for most useless protagonist in a while, I think, mm. <laughs> in yeah. an action movie like this. Um, yeah. outside of that, I mean, the K drama aside, right? The melodrama aside, I did, I did think that the score was fantastic. Mm, right. Yes, uh, of course, good. it added to the melodrama, but it was very, very well composed. The sound design was mm. great, and I really yes. did enjoy those parts. Um, I do think that both the young kids showed up the adult actors for sure. Mm, uh, yes. In terms of their performance, in terms of like how nuanced their uh, characters were, uh, mm. that I think that was something that kind of took me by surprise. Because a lot of the time when we do get, you know, um, kid characters who are in this sort of post-apocalyptic dystopia, right? We don't always get that kind of, um, the kind of nuance, right? A lot of the time they're just perfunctionary, you know, uh, and they're either like motivation, which mm. the kids do serve in this particular case, but they don't have much agency of their own. So it was yeah, kind like, of nice uh, to see that. I mean, you see that in Bird Box, you see that in a, a quiet place, things like that. The kids are kind of just there. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. like, that was kind of refreshing to see. I think, if anything, the two kids were kind of more the heroes of the story than anything else, despite the fact that, uh, I mean, they do get their fair share of action, surprisingly. Oh, yeah. the, the, the action sequence I was talking about, uh, actually, both of them are kind of primarily led by the kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, still, like, the, the characters were kind of flat, right? In compar- If we were going to make a comparison with, with Train to Busan. Mm. Uh, I do feel like we got a much more empathetic villain in the first one. I feel like we got more nuanced and more compelling character motivations in the first one as well. Mm. Um, I felt like the zombies in the first one were also more impressive. I think in terms of like the body acting and like all of that. They were practical. Uh. We saw a bit of the body acting in the ferry, but uh, again, much like the xenophobia thing, it was kind of just touched the point and then like yeah. never came back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Only in that one scene, right? On the boat. Yeah, Pretty correct. Yeah. yeah. So outside of that, like I, I think with when you reach a point that you realize what kind of ride you're in for, you kind of suspend your your disbelief and just like go along with it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So it ends up being a fun ride after all, yeah. you know. But uh, yeah. So it's still good, just not you know great, and maybe not what I thought it would be given how it was built. I I agree. There's a lot of hype for this film. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a cartoon in the best way, and it's a cartoon in the worst way. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, so I feel like you know, for all its flaws in terms of characters and performances, it's still you know the action sequences at least at the very least, right? Still deliver, and that's what you want from an action movie. Uh, mm-hmm. good action. Yep. So that's why I think rating wise, I can't. Feel it, but at the same time, I can't give it a high mark. So yeah, it's a, it's a six out of ten for me. Yeah, same. I'm gonna give it a six. Yes. Um, sticking with uh Asia, uh, just across from the Korean Peninsula is Japan. Uh, and apparently in this anime, um, a different disaster hits them. Uh, this <laughs> is Japan Sinks 2020. It is the latest adaptation of uh from the science fiction writer um Sakyo Kamatsu's 1973 uh 
disaster novel, Japan Sings. Uh, this time it comes to us in anime form, overseen by extremely prolific uh, anime director Masaki Yuasa. Um, mm-hmm. I think we've reviewed a ton of his work. I yeah. think most recently I reviewed Ride Your Wave, and then uh, we also reviewed Devilman Crybaby last year. Yeah. Um, so this Netflix series kind of wastes a uh, little time in dishing out but apocalyptic imagery uh, pr- promised by its title. Yeah. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, soon after a low-level earthquake hits Japan, a stronger one follows, causing uh, buildings to crumble and pound bystanders into gory paste uh, you know, beneath the rubble. Uh, the earth vomits gas and magma. The ground splits open. Um, basically, you know, like it's kind of transformed Japan into this alien new configuration of, of, of dystopic proportions. Um, rather than the scientific and political perspectives of the novel um, and its previous adaptations, mm-hmm. uh, Japan Sings 2020 takes a markedly more, um, I would say, personal viewpoint uh, yeah. of the, of uh, specifically with the, through the lens of a mixed race uh, family called the Muto family uh, and the companions that they pick up along the way, um, coupled with some surprisingly, surprisingly spare and, and soothing music on the soundtrack. Yep. Uh, the, the, the depictions of the family is uh, early reunion so it kind of suggests uh, uh, an optimistic take on, on a larger scale disaster story, a, a focus on togetherness and a celebration of uh, the human capacity to adapt even amid uh, turmoil. Uh, but then, you know, like <laughs> when, when, but when bodies rain from the sky, um, Japan sings uh, kind of shows its teeth then, uh, you know, characters die in sudden jarring oh, uh, yeah. ways uh, that kind of disorient the viewer in a similar fashion to these travelers whose only option is to kind of press forward on an island that can offer them no refuge. Um, throughout the series, the characters are kind of, um, I, I guess, mostly defined by archetypical qualities um, with new ones introduced almost as soon as the previous ones are lost. Yeah. Um, so it kind of gives the, the, the family's odyssey something of, um, I guess, a mythic quality as they make their way through symbolic destinations mm-hmm. uh, from an open, seemingly empty grocery store to a community that practice, practices um, the Japanese art of pottery repair, I believe it's called kin kintsugi. Yep. Um, and yeah, so um, what 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 do you think about uh, Japan Sinks twenty twenty? Oh man, uh, it goes it all goes downhill from the moment they take that picture, right? When when the family finally reunites after the first kind of thing. Mm. Uh, um, I've got a bit of mixed feelings about Japan Sinks twenty twenty. Like a lot of the reviews say, you know, it's shocking, it's moving, it's emotional, and all of that. But mm. I'm not really sure if it, for me at least, like it kind of lived up to that. Same. I feel like what we got here was literally a series of unfortunate events, right? Yeah. Uh, just one after another. The yeah. way in which the characters die are too random and too convenient for my liking, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't quite serve much um, purpose except to continue to push the plot forward. Mm-hmm. And not that it is, there is much of a plot to begin with, right? It is... Uh, beautiful as the animation style is and as mm. great as I found the soundtrack and unnerving as I found the soundtrack, right? Having that Correct. kind of music against this disaster porn um, yeah. fiesta. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really didn't feel... Oh man, this is hard to say, but it didn't feel like there was enough pathos, right? For, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I, I, I kind of understand why people would resonate with the material. I, I think like it got fairly good ratings all around from what I was reading. Mm. Uh, but there was just something about the way that it felt extremely rushed. Like I need to squeeze this many bad things in this amount of time mm. in order for me to get the shock and awe factor yeah. uh, without exploring the emotion, the full spectrum of emotional after effects. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, given when when you are caught in a, a situation like that, there isn't time. So I understand mm-hmm. why, but at the same mm-hmm. time, it feels entirely dissatisfactory to mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, kind of mixed feelings on this one. I I went into it like really wanting to like it. Um, same. like you know they kind of blow you out of water. Your you, the you, deaths come in you know the second episode. And like they keep coming after that, and you don't, you can't get attached to anyone in particular. So much so that I had trouble keeping, um, I had trouble keeping up with the characters. Right, you introduce yeah. someone new, someone yeah. else dies, and then you just keep moving forward and you keep moving forward. I guess in the end, it is somewhat of a 
happy ending, I if you want to put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no cautionary tale here, you know. There's no um, there's no full exploration of um, what happens to humanity when when shit hits the fan. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and everything kind of falls apart. You catch glimpses of that, but they're just touch points. You know, nothing is really fully explored. You just keep moving and moving from one of one tragedy to another, which doesn't allow the viewer to have any time or any kind of space to, to connect with, with uh, what they're seeing. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head there. I think the show's uh, limitation kind of becomes apparent when it, it slows down midway, right? And they're no longer relying on the pure momentum of uh, disaster and the plot twist and the striking images of the devastation. Uh, when Japan Sings 2020 actually allows space for us to absorb the characters' deaths, you feel like there is little to mourn. Yep. Um, you see deaths loom over every episode. Um through the killing of like main and supporting cast members at a, at a steady pace, uh, it kind of yields diminishing returns. Um, if you expect death to be around every corner, then death just becomes a feature of the corner. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the death and loss depicted here becomes so repetitive that the series kind of verges on exploitation at, at mm-hmm. points. Um, and it's kind of further hampered by the weird messaging behind those deaths. Um, although a natural disaster should be indiscriminate, uh, to who it affects. Uh, yeah. The characters most unwillingly killed by the earthquakes kind of express greed or, or, or gluttony shortly before dying. Um, I guess in the end, the overriding ethos here is that the good people are willing to come together despite catastrophe and, and pain and displays of self-interest like nationalism. So like you see the love between the Muto family and in other relationships constantly expressed itself in, in elder characters sacrificing themselves for the good of the future. Uh, and I guess you are sub believes the older generation is responsible for facilitating Japan's future. I guess that's the message. Um, mm-hmm. Leaving it to the youth to to improve the country's flaws. Um, I think the idea is okay. Um, the series, though, kind of moves on from the tragedy of these characters' lives so quickly that we don't get a sense of their grief. Yeah. Um, and, and the result is, despite no shortage of daring escapes and shocking deaths, uh, is a disaster story that has a very hurried pace and a reticence to grapple with grief, which kept me emotionally distant. Uh, yeah. So I didn't feel and the impact that I should actually from from people dying. Um, but I guess nevertheless, like Japan Sings does value human relationships and what they mean, and there's plenty of love and frustration in the series, which uh, amongst a disaster of this magnitude, fans will enjoy. Um, it's beautiful, it's violent and grounded and, and tender at times, so mm-hmm. I guess it deserves respect. Yep. Uh, but, man, uh, I, I can't get over the fact that I felt uh, very little watching this. Yeah, yeah. But I, I had people tell me it was quite a cry fest, right? But, like, I don't know if it's because I, I, I pretty much binged the whole thing and it went one go, mm-hmm. um, but it really didn't resonate with me in the way that I thought that it would, you know? Um, like, as far as you know, emotionally difficult and heart wrenching anime go, this doesn't really rank up there with you know, like your grave of the fireflies or anything of that sort. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 good, right? For fans who like post apocalyptic stuff, uh, who like this particular genre uh, mm. of well, it's a kind of an honestly a bit of a niche. Uh, like anime disaster porn isn't all that common, to be honest. Yep. Uh, sure, they and they will enjoy just kind of the the art of it, right? Both in terms of the music and uh, in terms of the the visuals itself. But other than that, uh, it was just lacking something. I I agree. I think it's a uh, somewhat flawed uh, by its uh, desensitizing nature. Um, how would you rate this? I'm gonna give it a five point five. 5.5. Yeah. Okay, I'm giving it a 6 uh, also. Um, so, not not super high recommends, but yep. it's not a fail. Um, I think there are good aspects to it, but there's also uh, a dissatisfactory aspect to it, like, as, as Isa mentioned. So, um, you can check this out on Netflix uh, if you want to. I wouldn't disrecommend it or anything, yeah. but uh, there, are, there are better things out there to watch. Like. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, if you're in the mood for kind of like tra- mm. fast food tragedy, right? Then, Correct, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and at least this one doesn't have Gerard Butler fighting a comment or something. So That um, is true. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it could be so much worse. Uh, next up, we are talking about uh, not something that you can watch, but something that you listen to. Uh, we'll be talking about Audible's uh, Sandman audiobook. It is directed by Doug Max, who previously adapted several other game and titles, actually. Um, 
to critical acclaim and fan support. Um, mm-hmm. It also vo- boasts um, an all-star voice cast as it recounts, uh, I guess, the adventures of Dream of the Endless uh, and his quest to rebuild his kingdom after a lengthy imprisonment. I uh, won't spoil too much if you haven't re- read the comics, uh, so you, you can go yeah. enjoy the Audible series. Uh. And I think <laughs> um, the it is called an audiobook, but really it's not. It's yeah. actually an audio drama. Yeah. Um, I listen to audiobooks. Uh, I have Audible. Uh, I listen to audiobooks. And audiobooks are, is a single narrator reading the book to you. This is a full-on production audio drama. It's mm-hmm. very different. You know, there is, uh, there is a score. There are different voices. It's dramatic and everything. So, um, I, I guess the, the first point I wanted to say is that it very faithfully adapts the first three volumes of the Vertical comic book. Um, Kind of right from the outside, the 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 fidelity to the source material by the creative team is is quite apparent, and yep. each chapter of the audio drama directly adapts from an individual issue of the comic series. Mm-hmm. Um, it's narrated by Gaiman himself, uh, so virtually every story is brought to life, uh, line for line, verbatim with uh Gaiman's uh narration, effectively uh, setting the scene, uh, quote unquote scene, uh, as the audio drama delivers. Uh, uh, it, it's it's storytelling uh, magic um, and Amazon I can tell has spared no ex- expense in this uh, audio adaptation with an orchestral score and, and mood setting sound effects uh, kind of dialing up the tarot and all fantastical wonder um, so yeah it's not an audio book at all it's an yeah. audio drama mm-hmm. yeah uh, what do you think about it oh I, I really enjoyed this I, I think <clears> like generally for game and stuff that gets adapted when he's on board with the exception of American God Season 2, unfortunately. <laughs> mm. um, like, you're going to get something good, right? When, as the creator is kind of like hands, uh, kind of more hands on with the project itself, like someone of Gamer's caliber and just how prolific he has been over the years. Mm-hmm. Oh, and of course, Sandman is one, one of those kind of like seminal stories, right? That we've gotten, uh, gotten from Gamer. And so next to watch next to Watchmen, it's it's probably the most respected comic book out there. Mm, exactly. So, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was surprised at how well they managed to capture the mood that would usually be filled in by visuals, right? In the comic mm. book itself, right? I've I've reread Sandman like <sighs> dozens of times at least, you know. So yeah. I'm very fam- I'm very familiar with um the the material. Uh, and to be able to experience that in a different medium that I felt was very true and very um, full. I, I, the fidelity, right, as you said, right, was, was surprising, right? I, I didn't expect to get that kind of fidelity from it. It didn't feel like I was missing out just because I was listening to an audio drama instead of reading the comic itself. Yes. Um, the the cast are amazing. I have to say, I'm I'm not the biggest James McAvoy fan, but I I do feel like his rendition of uh, Morpheus, Morpheus was was great, right? And mm-hmm. of course, uh, Kat Dennings is always as uh, she I think she's the perfect casting for Death. I really hope if they do go into TV or movie that you know they will consider her as Death because I love uh, what mm-hmm. she's doing. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and the whole list of them. Uh, Tara Negaton had a good John Constantine, I think. Uh, mm. Riz Ahmed's voice is so distinct. Yes, yeah, uh, definitely. That it was really kind of a, a little jarring to hear him as the Corinthian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, uh, and Andy Serkis, of course, uh, and Michael Sheen, uh, stellar performances as well. Hey, um, Michael Sheen played an angel in a different uh, new game and uh, adaptation, and he plays the devil here. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, all in all, I really, really enjoyed it. I have to say, the score was spectacular. Yeah. Uh, really, I think there were just moments where I was just kind of lost in the score itself, and sometimes I had to kind of rewind just to make sure that you know I was paying attention to where we were kind of at in the story. Correct. Uh, yeah. so yeah, all in all, it, uh, an amazing kind of like outing here from Game and and, and the team who worked on this. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think the adaptation is uh, is is faithful, uh, but it also kind of embellishes and expands on on small details from the original story. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're additive, you know, like it's it's ne- never a bad alteration. Um, in that sense, the the audio drama not only adapts but enhances the the comic story. Um, it is uh, very immersive uh, and and a great way to experience a landmark a landmark comic book for the first time if you haven't read it. Of course, mm, you know, yeah, you get the yeah. Story. Um. For those who missed the Vertigo series uh, the first time around, 
uh, you will love this. And and uh, long time readers will also find the audio drama uh, to be a refreshing experience. You know, kind of expertly uh, crafted with the with, with the magic like, that that is brought to life by a great voice cast at the height of their powers and. Uh, it, it kind of proves how timeless Gaiman's uh, story is, you know. So for those who are unfamiliar and for those who are familiar, I think this is a this is a home run for them. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I really like whether or not you you you're familiar with Sandman, right? Whether or not you're already a fan or you're a fan of Gaiman stuff, like I highly highly recommend this. Um, mm. And even if you're if this is your first kind of like dive into audiobooks or audio drama, this is a great place to start. I agree. Yeah, I mean, genre equality has has uh, reviewed uh, actually a bunch of uh, different audio drama podcasts here and there. I think the Wolverine one is, is something I was quite enamored with. Uh, but this one is, is right up there. Uh, how would you how would you rate this uh, adaptation? Ooh, uh, it's a nine out of ten for me. Sweet, yes, it's an eight point five out of me. So uh, very high recommends from from both of us. If if you have uh, not read it, please go listen to this. But I mean, I do have to say like, that you do have. You do have to eventually read a comic book because uh, it's mm, amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and there's so much material, kind of that, right? You have all your companion kind of books as well. Yeah. Uh, once you kind of dive in, like uh, it, it will suck you into you know <laughs> the, the entire world that um, Gaiman has mm. built. There's tons of tons of spinoffs about you know the, the different siblings. Uh, Death have has their own uh, graphic novels, especially you know uh, there are prequels and, and all of them. That especially the ones that are written by Gaiman are, mm, are very good. Yeah. Uh, one spinoff not written by Gaiman by Mike Carey, I believe, about Lucifer is also very good. Excellent. So, uh, uh, not to be confused with what's going on on Netflix at the moment. Uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, Lucifer is coming back next month, which I'll, I'll review. Um, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. Um, Sandman, a very high recommend. Eight point five for me. Nine from uh, Isa. Uh, next up, we'll be talking about um, Snowpiercer, which is kind of um, the TV adaptation of uh, Jacques uh, Lop and uh, Jean Marc Rochette's uh, French comic series, which was obviously made famous by Bong Joon Ho, Oscar winner Bong Joon Ho, mm-hmm. uh, with his incredible film version back in 2014. Um, and its journey to television, before I get into the actual show, is actually a highly publicized debacle. Um, it includes more than three years in development, uh, two directors shooting and reshooting the pilot. So there were two different pilots, not including the pilot that they showed. Uh, a controversial showrunner swap in the middle of shooting the latest pilot. Uh, a ping pong <laughs> between Warner Media Networks. It was switched between four different channels. Um, Snowpiercer was originally a TNT series order, and oh. then it was... Yeah, yeah, and then it was announced as the first drama to debut on a revamped TBS, and then it was rerouted to uh, um, what was it called? Uh, HBO Max, and then mm-hmm. it was rerouted back to TNT. Uh, so it was such a mess. Um, oh man! And and now that it's finally here, uh, people are wondering what what the Snowpiercer TV show is like. Um, I saw has seen the full season. I have seen four point five episodes. Uh, but I can say that the basic premise remains the same. Uh, yeah. The train is there. Uh. The, the train is there. The, the world is still, is still frozen over. Uh, the rich live on the back of the poor. Um, yeah, but uh, well, well, other than that, it, uh, it stars Jennifer Connelly, David Dix as the new lead. Um, so what, what, what do you think about the, the TV um, adaptation of uh, Snowpiercer? It wasn't bad. Right, okay. like um, just to give so kids and I were were kind of discussing uh, as we were going through the stuff that we needed to watch to review for the month, mm-hmm. uh, and we 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 stumbled upon Snowpiercer and we we're just kind of like you know is it really worth watching? And we at at that point in time hits what, what you were at what uh, four and a half episodes in right, and I had I just finished episode five, yeah, and I just like I don't really know if I want to kind of like push through that because it's a bit rough in the beginning. Mm. Uh, especially I feel like uh, on the one hand for people who have watched the movie right it is immediately familiar yes. uh, but at the same time they take a lot of uh, uh, they take a lot of their own sweet time to kind of develop the differences in the world that we kind of see between the original movie and, and um, the series itself uh, fair enough um, but uh, it, it the first couple of uh, episodes were, were a little rough to kind of get into, so mm. I, I after kind of like finishing everything else that we had to review, I was just thinking, you know what, I've got like a day or two before we record, 
Mm. Um, I, I'm just gonna like trying to catch something while I'm ha- having my lunch and stuff like that. So I I powered through the other five episodes, uh, yeah. largely because I'm a big fan of David Diggs and everything that he's been doing recently. From you know uh, blind blind spotting, spotting Hamilton obviously and Hamilton, we we, we yeah. raved about on on Behold, and uh, mm. I just felt like you know what I mean like. I, I will watch a series if I like the actor in it. And of course, I love Je- Jennifer Connelly and kind of the many roles that she's played. Mm. So, they, both of them put up pretty phenomenal performances, I have to say, despite um, a somewhat lackluster supporting cast uh, mm. or lackluster performance from the supporting cast, right? There are a lot of players in this story and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to be invested in anybody else other than um, Andre Layton played by David Diggs and uh, Melanie Cavill who, who's played by Jennifer Connelly. Uh, it's very obvious that they are the two kind of like linchpins of the entire series. You know, uh, mm-hmm. there's a lot of to and fro, there's a lot of politicking involved. Um, not as fully developed as I would like it to be. I think like it struggles with a lot of pacing issues. Oh yeah. Despite offering... A, f- a substantial amount of action, I think, um, uh, uh, more than I expected them to have, and maybe that's kind of the issue. It's that like they do breeze past a lot of issues um, that aren't explored, right? You say, oh, you know, we have, uh, we are living in a, we're the last remnants of humanity, and this is, you know, uh, a result of that, and we've had to make decisions, and these are the consequences about it. But they kind of like tell you that right they mm. don't show you that uh at no point in time does it really feel as cohesive as i think it needed to be and mm. it was just something about the way that the movie had more of a the the train felt like one train mm. right uh like as you progress through the cars because we we are essentially seeing it from the point of view of uh Chris Evan, uh, Evans' character and you know uh, kind of their journey up the train that felt more cohesive and yep. a lot less um, uh, piecemeal, right? I I think mm. a lot of the the scenes in the series itself had too uh, too much dissonance between the different kind of cars that they had, right? Mm. Like it never really quite feels like it is one is a single entity that everybody is kind of living on, and it struggled with that a fair bit. Uh, mm. all the way up to like the last couple of episodes where that that cut they they finally because of the literal movement of people along the train that you actually feel like it it makes sense Mm -hmm. in a spatial uh, manner Mm -hmm. yeah so all in all I mean like it's it's not a bad watch right like as far as like sci-fi adaptations go I do feel like they took a fair bit of liberty with their interpretation of the comic book itself Uh, Mm -hmm. if you're looking for like an expanded uh, telling of the movie, you'll be very disappointed because it's a very different story. Yep. Uh, um, David Diggs is still a joy to watch, and I think like um, both uh, him and Jennifer Connelly do a great job just kind of playing off each other. Whenever mm-hmm. they're in the same scene together, there is a a great amount of tension that's very palpable, and they kind of steal the show all the time. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is that they're so good at what they are doing on screen that everybody mm-hmm. else just kind of like feels very meh. And oh, I yeah. think that's the kind of the problem for me is like that this had a lot of promise. I, I really think that it could have been great, but mm-hmm. a lot of parts just felt pretty meh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, w- like one of the big issues is that um, TV, uh, TV is now, it's not what TV was like ninety like like in, in the 1990s like, or the early 2000s even. You know, like TV now is a big deal. There's a lot of movie stars on TV. Uh, but I do have to say that TNT is still basic cable. Uh, and and David Dix as the Broadway star and Jennifer Connelly as the movie star still feel a bit outsized uh, next to the basic cableness of the rest of the cast. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, like, you know, I, I know I didn't make it to the end, so unfair to criticize this, but I like uh, kind of the, the thrilling constant progression of a lower class up the train towards the, towards the engine of uh, social equality, you know, uh, a kind of a very exciting action movie metaphor yep. for uh, a, a Marxist allegory mm-hmm. uh, has, been, has been turned into a, a <laughs> All American shows do um, a crime procedural, a murder mystery. Yeah. Um, for the large part of its first season, I don't know if the season ends up that way, but uh, that's what threw me off at first. Also, 
uh, yeah, it's as far away as the Bong Joon Ho version as you can get. Uh, perhaps it's unfair to compare it to the Bong Joon Ho version, but yeah. it's unavoidable. It, it, I, I totally understand what you mean. I think, like in large part, the fact that it became a procedural just really threw me off in the beginning. The problem yeah. is, is that after you get into the procedural part, uh, it it becomes like something else altogether and then it becomes something mm. else altogether and then you finally kind of get the revolution that you want and yep. then like you know you um you get a very different kind of payoff from the movie as well right. and yeah. then they introduce the cliffhanger at the end of the season you know mm. in case they, they get something next right. to uh, so like a lot of uh, I'm not sure the show the show knows what it wants to be Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a bit of an issue as well. Although, like, switching it up was interesting enough. But the problem is at the same time, like, you don't get the kind of depth that you want, right, from the politicking or even, like, kind of, like, the spy elements that were going on and all these, like, kind of intricate webs of planning and strategy on on multiple parties involved on the, on the train. Yes. Uh, you get yeah. some of that, but it doesn't feel quite complete. You know, and once you kind of settle into that rhythm and you say, oh yeah, okay, I can kind of see how there's a, well, they, it drops off and then it goes into something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's strange that this, it's almost 10 hours runtime in total. It's strange yeah. that the 10 hour series didn't quite manage to capture the same kind of thematic resonance and depth that a two hour, 15 minute movie did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. just because it is meandering, I guess, much like the track that they are on. It's like... Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm I, not sure if I can say that it has potential to become something really good, just okay. because, like, I don't think there was much here in the first season to kind of prove that. Uh, mm. Interesting cliffhanger. Uh, they do introduce something completely outside of what uh, the movie or uh, even the comic book kind of, like, touches on. So, okay. um, I'm curious to see where it goes, uh, but it's a very soft recommend for me if you're kind of into that particular idea, right? Like, okay. it's uh, uh, Murder on the Orient Express, uh, but uh, in a post-apocalyptic future, so... Okay, yeah. so how would you rate it? I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. 6? Okay, okay. I've, um, from what I've seen, it's a 5, la. like, I can't really feel it, yep. but it's okay. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Um, anyways, we're moving on uh, to... Uh, okay, when I heard about this movie, <laughs> did not plan it to be on... Uh, oh, man. I, I'm even conflicted as to tell you what the premise is, but I have to, uh, to kind of justify why it's on genre. Yeah, but I don't think we're giving anything away, right? Because no, no, it's in the synopsis. It is, but I didn't know what the synopsis was when I was ah, watching right, that. Right. I, I didn't even watch the trailer because I was given the, like uh, uh, an early uh, screener copy for my job uh, to watch it. So went in blind, didn't know. I, I it said rom com on the on the screener, so mm. I, I was expecting a rom com. So, anyways, um, the movie we're talking about is Hulu's uh, Palm Springs. Um, it is uh, without spoiling, I I think it's it's the biggest laugh out loud comedy uh, in, <laughs> in, in in film this year. Yeah. Um, it's produced by the Lonely Island Comedy Troupe. Uh, which is kind of famously led by uh, SNL's and Brooklyn Nine-Nine star Andy Samberg. Um, it follows uh, a carefree and nihilistic character called Niles, uh, who is played by Andy Samberg, who is kind of a guest at a, at a destination wedding in Palm Springs mm -hmm. um, for reasons unbeknownst to us. Uh, and this is at a point of the movie that really caught me off guard. Um, he's been living in a time loop. So I didn't know it was a time loop movie up until that point. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the movie kind of takes like it takes a bit so yeah it takes get a bit there, right yeah it so does. I, I had like a, a five minute like um double takes like what am i what, what's happening here you know um not that i'm unfamiliar with time loops i just didn't expect this to be a time loop movie so <laughs> in essence uh niles has been reliving the same wedding uh over and over again for a very long time it's a bit like a uh, groundhog groundhog's day meets uh ben wilder yeah. um Niles is the kind of character who uh, joyously thumbs his uh, nose at authority figures and yet uh, remains charming, is very Andy Samberg-esque. Um, to that end, uh, Niles attends this same wedding in shorts and a Hawaiian shirt. Um, he knows the best speeches by heart. He, he spends his day uh, laying around in a pizza raft on a pool and drinks a lot of beer. Uh, worryingly, he's actually very comfortable in his existence, unlike a lot of other time loop protagonists, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a life without age or death 
or responsibilities, he just has to attend a wedding and live every day as though it's not his last. Um, rather than fight, he accepts the meaninglessness of the of life as a comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, that is until he hooks up with the bride's older sister named Sarah, played by Kristen Malotti, um, the mother from How I Met Your Mother. Mm -hmm. uh, when the two head uh, to the desert to kind of have sex, they, she becomes... Um, trapped in a glowing red cave uh this magical <laughs> cave um somehow pulls her into niles's time loop and unlike niles um sarah is does spend a significant amount of time trying to discover ways to escape the loop uh to no avail of course you know yeah nevertheless over the series of events uh niles and sarah they go closer uh, you know, they, they do a lot of crazy antics, uh, like uh, like stealing a plane or sunbathing in the pool or 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 uh, crazy shit like that. <laughs> um, it's it's very funny stuff, like, like their dynamics. You know, like Niles's uh, silly sense of humor and Sarah's kind of very uh, robust cynicism uh, match for a fantastical love story. Mm, yeah. So um, both Sandberg and Melotti are are, are very uh. The, the chemistry is amazing in, in this kind of freewheeling, uh, loopy style. Um, though they do live each day to the fullest, in the end, they are still only living one day to its, uh, to its infinite uh, possibilities. Uh, it's still just one day. You know, Chance is reduced to assurance. Uh, risk is reduced to safety. Uh, love is rendered nearly inconsequential. Uh, so that's essentially kind of what this time loop rom-com is about. Uh, um, so, so what do you think about Palm Springs? <laughs> Uh okay, so it, I knew what the premise was because you told me about it before I watched it, right? Yeah. Uh, it still took me by surprise the way in mm. which it planned planned out. I think like the sharp swerve left that it took from the first twenty minutes. Uh, completely, I was just like, "What? Seriously?" Mm. You know, uh, we're kind of doing that. Um, uh, what really amazed me is that, like, I mean, like Samberg and Milotti, great, great chemistry. Um, really solid performances here. Their comedic timing is so like on 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 the dot, and you know, just like them playing with each other is a joy to watch. Uh, in general, yeah. but above and beyond the comedy, I think what surprised me most is that there are these moments where you kind of sink into, like, uh, the characters sink into these greater kind of existential contemplations, right? Mm -hmm. It's like going from like nihilism to cynicism to to the humanism and. They are fairly well nuanced and thought out, uh, or well mm -hmm. uh, articulated, for something mm -hmm. that you, is essentially right uh, a rom com ground day, uh, yeah. and that really uh, I really enjoyed that. I wasn't expecting that at all, um, and it tickled me right just just because like it's well, it reminded me a bit of like some of the best moments from from the good place. You know, yeah. where despite all the absurdity that's kind of going on, all the ridiculousness that's kind of going on and shenanigans they find themselves in, like mm -hmm. there are these moments of like really kind of like deep stuff, like pockets of it here and there. That's just enough to, you know, get you thinking about uh, what is the nature of time? What is the nature of, of uh, who are you when there are no consequences, right? Um, you yeah. know, the idea of like... Uh, um, taking your own life because you want things to kind of end and like uh, mm -hmm. all of that gets compressed into this very neat kind of like very breezy enjoyable story right yeah. and uh, th those were the things that kind of st stood out to me yeah uh, and uh, I mean like it's very 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 little that I can nitpick on for this uh, this movie I agree. It's it's a nice little rom com that is smarter than it seems at first. Um, it's an existential movie, but when whenever I say existential, people always assume existential nightmare. <laughs> this is more like an existential parade, uh, adorned with glitter and fun. Yeah. Um, like, but amidst the laughs, though, you know, Palm Springs can be surprisingly introspective and profound. It's a it's a movie with themes about being able to find happiness in what can feel like meaninglessness. Yeah. Um, and repetitive drudgery. Uh, it's all about uh, the abiding loneliness of existence and ultimately about being stuck with yourself um, with not just your own tendencies, but the ever-present weights of your history. Uh, how much of what you do is because uh, it makes you happy and how much is you building towards some future goal and, and how much do those future goals really matter? Uh, what if you are stripped away of all possibility of any future goal mm -hmm. 
or, or the normal external benchmarks of personal growth that you can define yourself with, you know, yep. uh, would that make life more meaningful or less meaningful? Um, and and they are kind of tackling these questions amidst this very big <laughs> crowd pleaser, you know. Yeah, it's a it, it's <laughs> kind of like um art comedy that I feel like uh has uh, that will become like a kind of a future classic. Oh when yeah. You talk about when you talk about um time loop movies. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I definitely think like I I really hope that it's getting the kind of attention that that it deserves. Uh, yeah. I haven't really heard too much about uh, about it on on my newsfeed or anything of the sort. I guess not, you know, not not in Singapore like, because yeah. Hulu is not available here. But apparently, it broke. Uh, it's the highest watch uh, thing on Hulu. It broke. It broke their record. Like. Nice, nice. I mean, I've, I've always enjoyed what Sandberg has been doing. So, mm-hmm. like, I'm glad to see him kind of taking a dive into something a bit more semi-serious and a bit more nuanced than what he's been doing. Yeah. Uh, on his own, of course. Like the stuff he's doing on Brooklyn Nine Nine is is in the class of its own. I think. Uh, but yeah, I totally enjoyed that. Uh, really, really enjoyed uh, Christine Milotti's uh, character mm-hmm. um, performance. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, highly recommend it. Um, it is very satisfying. Uh, yeah, to watch. Like I think the payoffs all kind of the emotional payoffs all hit the right notes at the right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, they don't overcomplicate uh, anything that that doesn't need to be over overcomplicated. Despite the fact that you know they do throw in some. Uh, pretty far out science here and there yeah uh, but yeah I mean I, I love it it's great yeah. it, it took me by surprise uh, like when you recommended that uh, to watch it I was just like damn okay mm. uh, I didn't think uh, uh, we would get what I, I ended up watching oh yeah man uh, we're, we're kind of inundated uh, with a lot of uh, time loop stories of course um, some of them are great you know like your Russian dolls mm. and 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 Palm Springs, of course, you know, but some of them are like, you know, normal everyday TV show kind of tropes. Uh, and this is on the high end of it. Yeah, I would, I would, for sure. I would uh, rate it a 9 out of 10. It's an 8.5 for me. Nice. Okay. Uh, very highly rated for Palm Springs. Uh, do go watch it. Uh, it's not one of the bigger titles this month, but uh, I would say it's the kind of the best thing that we are reviewing this month. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next up, we are moving on to Netflix and a, not a series, sorry. Uh, well, I guess it could be a series of movies. Um, but for now, it is just one movie called The Old Guard. Um, mm. It is written by Eisner Award winning writer uh, Greg Rucker, who uh, you may know from Gotham Central, Queen and the Country, and a bunch of other great comic books. Uh, this new film is based on his comic book of the same name. Uh, and unusually, um, he also writes the movie. Um, this is very unusual. Oh. Comic adaptations never get the actual comic writer to write the movie and the huh. screenplay. It's not like Greg Rucker and, you know. Yeah. It's just Greg Rucker. Uh, so um, he is uh, a unicorn in the, spe- in the space of uh, comic book adaptations uh, because he gets proper ownership of his shit, you know. Yeah. And... and I think the the old guard definitely feels like it could be a, a kick ass uh, kickstart to a potential new superhero franchise. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. um, in in a in a few short weeks, it's it's been viewed by uh, seventy two million households, uh, making it uh, number eight in Netflix's uh, top ten most viewed movies of all time. Uh, so it's quite an achievement for a superhero um, film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's it found success outside of the cinemas, which kind of goes to show the trending of uh, viewership uh, and consumerism these days. Um, the film itself it, it follows a tight knit group of mostly immortal warriors uh, who have uh, who have covertly been protecting the world for centuries. They take out you know like warlords and terrorists and criminals, and it features a rather grounded and violent uh, image comics esque approach to super powered action. But it never gets too gratuitous, you know. Um, it it also does a great job of making us invested in the, these uh, renegade badasses who from the jump are portrayed as impossibly skilled warriors. You know, uh, they've been at it for a long time. Uh, you can tell because the 200-year-old guy is kind of the baby of the group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sh- uh, Charlize Theron uh, plays a character named Andy, which is... Uh, which is um, short for something which I won't spoil uh, but uh, she's about 7,000 years old and it kind of continues her, her career renaissance uh, lately as, a, as an action heroine oh actually, yeah uh, which started in, in Fury Road and then Atomic Blonde and then, and then continues here um, the plot itself is is fairly basic superhero stuff uh, but the enjoyment lies in its execution mm. uh, it, execution being um, 
weaponized Highlander, I guess, uh, is how, what I would call it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would you? Uh, how, uh, what do you think about the old guy, the the movie? Uh, I I enjoyed it. I mean, like it is a little run of the mill. I have to say. Um, the, story wise, yeah. Right, story wise, yeah. a bit run of the mill. I mean, there's nothing kind of outstanding about that. Uh, I love Charlie Theron doing that. <laughs> doing the badass chick thing. Uh, I think like I, I was a little sad about her not being Furiosa anymore. Mm, but it is a prequel uh, for that one. Yeah, I, you know, but I'm just not having her return in that particular role, which kind of like cemented her. I mean, the only other kind of like major action thing that she did prior to that was what? Atomic Blonde. Aeon Flux? Aeon Flux. Oh, Aeon Flux. Prior to, yeah, prior, prior, to prior to Mad Max, right? Because Atomic right, Blonde yeah. after that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I enjoyed Atomic Blonde, but like, wow, Furiosa was really it, you know? And uh, she kind of returns to a similar character type here. Kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, the very hard, uh, hard-ass, like very uh, HD kind of like leader of this group of, uh, well, honestly, immortal misfits, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did, I did enjoy that. I, I do feel like I would have wanted a bit more kind of focus on the consequences of their immortality. I don't think they really explored that, though. Despite the fact that there were many points or many like moments in the film itself where they could have just spent a little bit longer, kind of like you know focusing on that. Uh, we don't really get that because it's so jam packed full of action, um, mm. and the action is great. I have to say, right? Um, you know, your body is like flying around like multiple ways of like killing people that mm-hmm. are incredibly wild and incredibly inventive and some of them you don't see coming which is great uh, yeah. fight chore- choreography is great you know so all of that stuff makes for a very kind of like uh, it's an enjoyable action film right like I have no complaints about what it is uh, but I just thought I, I've, I've ne- I never read the actual comic book itself so I can't speak to whether or not uh, how faithful it is to that, but given that Grant Rucker wrote both the screenplay and the comic book, I, I don't think it would differ too much, right? Yep, definitely. Like, uh, according to Grant Rucker, who uh, I I just prior to this podcast, I was watching his interview on Kevin Smith's uh, Fat Man Beyond podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's essentially the same thing. Like he wrote the screenplay, uh, and it's it's he in fact he says the screenplay allowed him to make corrections to what he was dissatisfied with. Oh. In, in, in the initial comics run. So to him, it's an improved version of, of the comic. Lah. Um, so they're kind of like two main stories. Like firstly, they're supposed to uh, recruit a new immortal who is a, a black female Marine who died and was uh, revived uh, miraculously while in combat in Afghanistan. Uh, secondly, the group is also hunted by a, an evil pharmaceutical company. <laughs> um, like, I, I, like like. Oh my god! Re- re- reading that on paper, it makes it seem so meh. Uh, but apparently, they want to experiment on the immortals to synthesize their healing factor, uh, yeah. which is you know uh, okay. Um, the best parts of the movie is obviously the expertly choreographed fight sequences. Uh, but even better than that, and and you touched upon it. I wish I had spent more time on it. Are the, are the quieter moments that explore the emotional toll of immortality yeah. uh, and not, not, not just that but also the group's uh, sense of hopelessness because after fighting for, for centuries and thousands of years the world actually isn't getting any better and, yeah. and humanity is as, as bad as it's ever been uh, they're all tired and they're all on the verge of quitting because they aren't making a difference which is a cool lens to view this, these superheroes from now because mm. not many superheroes have that mentality um, I do think the, the film kind of spends uh, a lot of time, uh, in good and bad ways, trying to uh, expand the mythology of it. Uh, like, you know, it introduces, like, past uh, antagonists and past allies that can become future antagonists and future allies, you know, in, in a franchise-building move. Yeah. Um, some of it is intriguing, but some of it is kind of, like, unnecessary in terms of the pacing of the film, which kind of drags it a bit. Yeah. Uh, but I think overall it was, like, a, a really good action movie, and I think probably the best American action movie of 2020 so far. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. That that's not that's not a far fetched claim at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I I can't think of anything else that comes to mind. Uh, yeah. It 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 definitely f- feels like an action movie. It looks like an action movie. Um. And it it delivers on that for sure. You know. Mm-hmm. I I wish it was a bit more. Um. 
I just feel like when you're dealing with a with a kind of premise about like these immortal warriors, like there could have been more kind of just stories or like anecdotes mm-hmm. about like some of the fascinating things that they've done in their career, right? Uh, but yeah. we don't really quite get anything. Uh, unfortunately, I oh wow, we got a two bit villain. Like seriously, yeah, man. Uh, which was unfortunate because I I think that the premise for his motivations could have served as a fantastic kind of like moral dilemma, yeah. but we never yeah. get any of thing of that. Like it just goes straight to evil. He's just evil, right? Especially yeah, <laughs> like, so uh, Like yeah. he could have been like a, you know like a killmonger or something. You know where we could we could have like kind of rooted and understood where he was coming from. Yeah, and he's just Martin Shkreli here. <laughs> Exactly. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, he, he even looks like Squarely. Yeah. Yeah, so uh good, enjoyable. Uh yeah. like it's just a, it's just a kind of easy watch. Um you don't have to think too much about it with the cool premise and all of that, which mm-hmm. are with with enough setup for, for it to become like a franchise. And um I'm, I'm, I'll I'll watch the next one, you know. Oh uh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, how would you rate it? I'm gonna give it a six point five out of ten for me. Cool. Uh, I'm giving it a seven. Um, I think it is the saddest part about uh, the old guard is that I couldn't click next episode on it because this this feels like a really promising pilot. Yeah. Uh, ra- rather than a movie. Mm. Um. So I do hope that we get sequels because I am intrigued with the with the mythology and the world building that they presented here. So yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Um. Soft recommend for this one. Uh, next up, another thing that appeared on Netflix. Um. It is called A Whisker Away. Um, it was originally titled in Japanese as uh, One Thing to Cry, I Pretend to Be a Cat, uh, <laughs> which is a much better title. It is uh, a very spot-on title. Spot-on title. It, it explains the entire premise of the movie. Yeah, uh, so one literal. Thing to Cry, I Pretend to Be a Cat. But A Whisker Away is also kind of a, a sweet nod to a Spirited Away. So, you know, I get the, the wordplay there. Um, if you don't know, it is a, it's kind of the sweet uh, anime uh, that follows the story of Mio, who is an outcast junior high schooler with an overly exuberant spirit that some would find endearing and others would find them obnoxious um, <laughs> in, in order to escape her, her social, romantic, and parental troubles. Uh, the, her, her parents are divorced. Uh, one night, the girl is gifted with a magical cat mask that changes her into a kitten every time she wears it. Uh, she sneaks out of the house every night using her new cat self uh, to get close to a boy that she likes called uh, Hinode. Uh, this, of course, solves nothing and complicates everything. Uh, her human self is still a puzzlement to the boy, and it's only a matter of time until her parents realize that she's sneaking out for long stretches of time. Um, yep. As a cat, she encounters the the weird and possibly sinister quote-unquote mask vendor in his uh, cat form, who taunts her like a villain with an ulterior motive. Um, and, and reality and whatever the cat thing is uh, starts to blur together for Mio. And who, who wonders if uh, fantasy cat life is truly preferable to her bummer of a human existence. Uh, yeah. So uh, what do you think about uh, I Whisker Away? Uh, uh, it, was, it was nice, right? I, yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was, you know, kind of warm and fuzzy, uh, much mm-hmm. like the kittens in the story. Uh, I do feel like the conflict with the master was a little contrived, right? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't feel like the conflict there was necessary. I mm-hmm. would have gone with, like, the first 20 minutes of the movie with much less complication. Correct, Just because, yeah. like, that that was the standout part of the movie for me. Like, once we get into the action itself, I'm just like, uh, not really what I signed up for. Same. Uh, and it, it provides just a really kind of convenient... Um, resolution right uh to it at yeah. the end of the movie like we get you know they kind of like grow closer because you know shared trauma blah 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 uh <laughs> but like it it doesn't quite live up to the promise of the kind of magic that you see right with the, with um uh mio's kind of uh emotional um dilemma between when you're wanting to reveal how it is and just wanting to be able to spend time Yep. Uh, with Kendo, uh, like that, I feel could have been been fleshed out a lot more. Uh, mm. I'm not sure if we got enough of that. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, again, like uh, the the conflict is a little contrived, right? Like the the action, or, or whatever we can call as action, really wasn't necessary. I feel correct. Yeah. Um, so I, I wish for a much longer first half of this movie, basically. Same. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, for what the movie promised, I I I really liked. Uh, um, I think the the tackling of Mio's arrested development and, and and suggesting that she's frozen at the age where her parents split is kind of cool. Uh, she clearly doesn't want to deal with the pain of abandonment she feels from her mother. Um, so that's a nice emotional thing to tackle as well. Yeah. Um, her intensely fantasizing of a lovey dovey scenes, you know, uh, the way that she indulges in that is very cool. Uh, I like the, the the dive into her her emotional state and psychological state. Like, that's mm, cool. It's yeah. like cont- contemplative and earnest. You know, uh, has uh, melancholy and fantasy elements, which uh, uh, it, it's kind of a, a more imaginative take, I guess, on on the growing up is hard story. Like, yeah, um, for sure. But although it's it's lovely to look at uh, the film, uh, like you said, it like, has kind of needless uh, conflict. Uh, it tends to linger uh, a bit too much narratively, um, aiming for kind of a, a tonal elegance that is the hallmark of Ghibli features, but mm. not quite hitting the mark, no, you know? No. Uh, so yeah, while I do enjoy the, the them addressing uh, adolescent depression, and awkwardness in a meaningful way, uh, and also the the overall cuteness and fuzziness of the story. Uh, it's uh, not a uh, super successful, uh, not entirely successful, I would say. But I I I enjoyed it for the most part, considering it's breezy and not hard to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how much like you? Much it? like um, well, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm I'm gonna give it a a six. Right, like I think, like the first, the first kind of like two acts for me are enough to kind of give it a six. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, complete your thought earlier. Oh yeah. So uh, I mean, I was saying like much, much like um, uh, the old guard, right? Like Mm. I would really, really like to see the first like two acts of this as a pilot for a magical realism Mm. slice of life anime. Yep. That would be dope. Right, because it has all the features that I will look in 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 those like specific genres of anime, and I think they did a great job at those things. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah. So like uh, again, you know, uh, fans of cats, fans of anime, fans of great animation. I have to say, um, yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, like they tried something, they tried to emulate something, and didn't quite get there. You know, mm-hmm. I think spot on with with your insight into like the whole wanting it to feel like Ghibli esque. Uh, but it doesn't get more than a six from me. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, uh, it's a six from me as well. Uh, we we liked it, but didn't love it, lah. Essentially. Yeah. Uh, next up, we are moving on to a section I like to call quick hits, where I kind of uh quickly review some of the shows, uh, TV, uh, TV shows and films that uh my co-host hasn't been able to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and among those topics, uh, this month, uh, first one I'm going to be talking about is a new animated comedy uh, from the team behind Bob's Burgers. It's an animated musical comedy called Central Park. Uh, it is a genuinely joyful and infectious watch. Uh, Central Park follows the Tillemans, a dysfunctional family who live and work in the famed uh, New York Park. Um, gradually, the family gets caught up in a plot by a cruel hotel heiress who wants to fill the Central Park space with condos and chain stores. Um, it is led by an all-star voice cast, uh, ranging from uh, Hamilton alums like Leslie Odom Jr. and David Dix to Chris, uh, Kristen Bell and Titus Burgess. Uh, stellar songwriters, especially there's uh, Sarah Bareilles on it, oh. um, Amy, Amy Mann, Fiona Apple, Cindy Lauper, Megan Trainer. Uh, so the, the series kind of uh, brims with a uh, warm, catchy, and hilarious musical numbers about uh, the weirdos who call home, who call Central Park home. Um, that's it. The, the kind of the pleasures of Central Park are inverted when the music is lifting your spirits. Um, like when it when the music is not there, uh, the comedy and the, and the emotional parts of it is a bit on the thin side. Uh, mm-hmm. s- uh, some of this uh, kind of uh, owes to the heavy emphasis on on plotting that I and and kind of the plot is not super intriguing. Yeah. Um, and some of the regulars are also very broadly defined uh, in terms of character work. So there's a whimsy in the show's depictions of the many weird corners of Central Park, but but not a whole lot of big laughs when the music isn't playing. The music though is very funny hmm. uh, and it's very very catchy and very sing alongable. Uh, so thankfully the show is eighty percent musical. Uh, so the the rough patches are very quickly forgotten when the next musical number hits. Uh, so that's why it's a seven out of ten for me. Oh, okay. Uh, would you s- uh, would you say sorry. fans of Bob, uh, Bob's Burgers would enjoy this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, fans of Bob's Burgers. Well, I mean, musicals are kind of hard. Uh, some people just 
outright don't like musicals, yeah. but Bob's Burgers has a lot of musicals uh, uh, numbers true. in it too. Mm-hmm. So I think for the most part, yes, fans of Bob Burgers, uh, Bob's Burgers would definitely enjoy this. Um, it has a lot of potential to be a lot better uh, down the road. Um, it should also be noted that uh, as kind of a part of a movement to get uh, black characters to be played by black people, uh, with something which I, I totally support, um, Kristen Bell's role will be recast in season two oh, uh, since yeah. she voices a half black biracial girl. Um, weirdly, it was uh, Jenny Slate who kicked off this movement when uh, she quit Big Mouth because uh, she believed that Missy should be voiced by a black actress mm-hmm. and, and all power to them. Yep. Uh, so, uh, great moves and, and the right call because uh, I think the show was kind of uh, facing a bit of a, of a, of a backlash because of uh, Kristen Bo- uh, Bell voicing the biracial girl, which, you know, it's... Uh, it's not a big issue, but it can be corrected and it has been corrected. So, yeah, yeah that's nice uh, to go for it. Mm-hmm. Next up, I'm going to be talking about uh, a South Korean movie called The Witch Part 1, The Subversion, uh, <laughs> which is a very long title. Um, it was actually originally released in its home country in 2018. Uh, but this uh, South Korean sci-fi thriller is uh, available for streaming on Netflix US now. You know, So, um it, it wasn't released in Singapore in 2018. I had no way to watch it. it there was no VODs or Blu-rays or anything like that. So the fact that it comes to Netflix, for me, uh, makes it a 2020 movie in Singapore terms. Mm-hmm. So um, The Witch Part 1, it follows uh, Ja Yoon, uh, a genetically engineered little girl, an X-23 type, who uh, escapes from a COVID science facility, uh, but lost all her memory. She doesn't remember what happened there. Mm-hmm. She's found bleeding to death in the woods and adopted by a kindly old couple who run their own farm. Uh, and then the movie fast forwards to 10 years later. Uh, she is now a teen girl. Um, her family farm is on the verge of bankruptcy. So she decides to enter uh, a singing competition, an American Idol-esque competition to, to win money for her family. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when she makes it to the finals, she appears on TV. Uh, suddenly, the Black Ops agents, the, the facility that was holding her, realizes that she's out there. And then her life is upturned by all these Black, black Ops agents uh, kind of hunting her down. Uh, and and she, the discovery that she has superpowers. And that's kind of the setup. Oh. Uh, but, uh, okay, I don't spoil. But uh, from, from its brutal and electrifying fight scenes to kind of its gritty feel and the core mystery of it, the... Uh, the Witch Part One is an immensely exciting watch. It's 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 a fucking badass uh, action thriller, uh, like way more badass than the Old Guard is. Nice. Um, on the surface, the director Park Hun Jung is telling kind of a, a Superman adjacent story, I guess. You know, this special kid uh, becomes an orphan, grows up uh, in a farm, trying to fit up, trying to fit into a world that can't understand her. Uh, there's an it takes an extraordinary circumstances, uh, usually usually kind of a big evil thing, to get a character to find themselves and their true potential. That happens in this movie too. Hmm. But the beauty of the witch is kind of the the very very twisted and dark and sublimely satisfying place the movie takes us to once we realize our hero's true motivation. Uh, in short, there is a massive mind blowing twist in the middle of the film uh-huh. that that absolutely flips the story on its head like it's not what you think it is and obviously the twist being so big i can't really explain it yeah but the movie goes from like a seven out of ten to like a nine out of ten from there la, because you know it just it, it blows my mind la, like like what they did la. it's not a big thing but it's a plot revelation that changes what you think of the girl uh and and suffice to say the twist is the thing that elevates the witch part one from just another ya superhero origin story to uh-huh. something else entirely so if you want to see kind of a, a south korean uh super girl meets john wick uh this is it uh i can't review more without <laughs> spoiling what makes it john wick uh so i urge you to find out for yourselves um the witch part one is available on uh, netflix us it's an 8.5 out of 10 for me highly recommend it nice. uh and yes, oh my god, yes, I, I forgot about this movie. Uh, I, I super love this movie as well. It's an independent horror film called Relic, coming out of Britain. That's our next topic. Uh, so it's about kind of uh, intergenerational trauma and mental illness. It's kind of a theme that's been explored in horror films yep. for decades. Um, uh, most recently in Hereditary, uh, this new feature uh, is kind of a debut from Australian director Natalie Erica James, mm-hmm. and it pushes this subgenre forward with a movie, Relic. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of about watching a loved one lose their grip on reality. Yep. Uh, it is a chilling slow burner that combines the haunted house genre 
with a, a heartbreaking allegory for Alzheimer's and aging. Mm -hmm. uh, it approaches domestic horror from the perspective of an exhausted caretaker. In this case, uh, Kay, who is played by Emily Mortimer, who returns to her childhood home with her own daughter when her elderly mother, Edna, goes missing. Uh, Edna, you know, just went for a stroll and then she disappeared one day. Uh, when Edna returns days later with no memory of where she's been, that's kind of where the true horror begins. Uh, as, Kay and her, as, her, as Kay and her daughter kind of struggle to figure out how to take care of Edna, they are haunted by voices and visions signaling something is going very wrong. Uh, meanwhile, Edna's dementia gets worse. Mm -hmm. uh, the more terrifying and the more violent and the more forgetful she gets, the more scary the movie becomes. And, and after a while, the house itself becomes a physical manifestation of dementia and decay with uh, forgotten rooms and claustrophobic spaces and walls that close in on each other, kind of mirroring what is happening in Edna's brain. Uh, it's, it's a slow burn horror uh, of um, incredible patience, and, but the gradual suspense eventually builds to a monstrous climax in the end. Uh, James often frames the characters in close-ups with uh, still backgrounds that linger for a bit too long. It kind of creates this transfixing atmosphere of discomfort. And in terms of uh, uh, aesthetic craft in bringing mm -hmm. the transforming house to life, uh, it makes the house a character in itself. Wow. Uh, the, the manifestation of dementia is everywhere visually. La. Relic is filled with delicate symbols of uh, Edna's mental decline. You know, uh, The visual metaphors are all around. They're so rich and deep and subtle. Uh, the main cast gives a top-notch performance that, uh, that respond and feed off each other. Uh, veteran uh, Australian theatre actress uh, Robin Nevin, uh, who plays Edna, mm -hmm. uh, goes beyond the terrifying old woman cliche to, to kind of delicately balance, uh, with, with a delicately balanced performance that that imbues sympathy uh, to her character's, uh, with her character's sadness. Like, she's not yeah. just scary, she's also sad, you know. Um, Emily Mortimer is impeccable as always, uh, portraying Kay's struggle with uh, helping and loving her mother even when she's frightening. Uh, uh, Bella Heathcote is great as Kay's daughter, Sam, as well. Uh, so this is an impressive first feature that's uh, very humanist and, and compassionate uh, in talking about mental fragility and and uh, the sadness inherent in mental degeneration, mm. yet never forgetting to deliver spooky frights. Uh, Relic, uh, so far, at least of the year, uh, is, is the best horror movie I've seen in 2020. Uh, but it, because it's such a terrific subversion of the haunted house genre, mm -hmm. uh, I understand that many are not keen on this uh, A24 metaphor-driven <laughs> atmo atmospheric horror thing. Yeah. So it may not be for everyone. I'm just saying that straight up. But it is definitely for me. So it is an 8 out of 10. Oh, nice. Nice. It sounds interesting for sure. Yes. Uh, it is A24 styled, not A24. I'm just uh, <laughs> going to clear that up. But uh, I think A24 sort of uh, popularized this particular metaphor-driven atmospheric horror subgenre. Yeah. So, yeah, it falls definitely in that vein. So if you're a fan of hereditary, hereditary uh, you, you might love this as well. Uh, next up, I'll be talking about season two of The Twilight Zone. It is produced by Jordan Peele, of course, uh, his company, Monkey Paw Productions. It is a reboot of the classic sci-fi anthology, which came out with much hype last year. Uh, unfortunately, as I reviewed during last year's Quick Hits, uh, season one was terribly inconsistent. Mm -hmm. It was a mix of really strong, relevant stories alongside a lot of less compelling ones bogged down by their hour-long runtime. Uh, if you remember, The Twilight Zone was 20 minutes long. Yeah. So with this 60 minutes really kind of stretched out their premises. Uh, sadly, season two is still very much a mixed bag. Very much in the, in the uh, vein of season man. one. There's a lot of uninspired, unoriginal, overlong episodes. The, the main issue continues to be the length, you know? Uh, yeah. So in some cases, the extended runtime can help. Uh, in particular, is the case of the season's 10th episode entitled You Might Also Like which is just a pure masterpiece and the only episode I recommend you to go out of your way to watch this season. Uh, episode 10, you might also like. Uh, the, the rest range from bad to average and that's kind of a shame considering the talent of the actors involved and, and the money spent on production. Uh, but that being said, uh, episode 10 is a must watch. Um, I think it will go down as one of the series' uh, best episode, you know, uh, both in a modern run and a, and a classic run. Wow. It belongs it belongs up there with some of the originals, uh, legendary episodes. Uh, and there are actually a lot of um, continuity connections to uh, a lot 
to several famous episodes from from the original series. So uh, it's one of the ones that uh, benefit from repeat viewings mm-hmm. because it kind of suggests uh, a bit like Black Museum did that there is a shared uh, universe here. Okay. Uh, so it, it stars Gretchen Mole, who plays uh, Janet Warren, uh, a mother and wife living in a form of dystopian society where everyone is preparing for the arrival of their own quote unquote egg. EGG. Uh-huh. Uh, what is an egg? Uh, no one knows, aside from the fact that it's advertised as making everything better again. Uh, it will fix your family uh, and this time forever. So what does the, what is the egg? Like? That, that is the mystery. Uh, the technical prowess of this episode is unlike the rest, uh, including complex costume and makeup effects. But at its heart, uh, it tells a story about uh, making America great again, uh, free of partisan politics in, in, in metaphor form, like, which is what mm. the Twilight Zone does very well. And uh, more kind of draw, draws from other Twilight Zone characters, uh, giving us a, a woman who has uh, potentially suffered a personal loss. We're not never quite sure. Uh, but while others are finding happiness in material wealth, uh, Janet knows that she'll never be able to replace what she lost. Uh, by, by the time the final frame comes around, uh, with narrator Jordan Peele delivering one of the best outros of uh, of the new reboot, you realize that this episode is one of the timeliest episodes of uh, television around, especially in 2020. Uh, that episode is a 10 out of 10. The season overall is a 4 out of 10. So, Whoa, that's a huge gap. Huge gap, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the good part of anthologies is that you can pick and choose what episodes to watch. So, that is true. Uh, I I would suggest watching episode ten, you know. Uh, so that is uh, season two of the Twilight Zone. Next up on Netflix, there is a show called Warrior Nun. It is a fantasy show based on a manga series <laughs> that ran from the mid nineteen nineties to the early two thousands. It is a supernatural story that takes on uh, medical science, the Catholic Church, and everyday patriarchy. In its ten episodes, it follows. Eva, who is a 19-year-old quadriplegic woman uh-huh. who wakes up in a morgue and learns that she was chosen to be a part of a secret group of demon-hunting nuns <laughs> called the, the Order of the Cruciform Sword. Uh, it is basically a new spin on Buffy with religion as the villains. Uh, it has kind of the quipping flair of Buffy, uh, the sisterhood as power vibe of Buffy, you know that, that kind of thing, uh, with plenty of philosophical musings about faith versus doubt. Uh, Warrior Nun is kind of familiar, but uh, but when the show's impressive ensemble and commitment to thoughtfully exploring questions of individual purpose and religious repression really click, it becomes a distinct experience uh, rather than mm. a copy of those inspirations. Uh, Warrior Nun leans into kind of villainizing the church and, and condemning how they wield power. Yep. Uh, a, narr- a narrative true line that that stands uh, that starts out in century. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, it becomes uh, increasingly convoluted as the season progresses. You know, it was such a, a provocative and fiery metaphor, and then it becomes complex. Uh, uh, not in a good way, complex in a bad way, like, in terms of there's too many moving pieces. Uh, the main issue is, right, that one half of the story is just infinitely engaging, and the other half of the story is not. Mm-hmm. Um, everything involving the order of the cruciform sword is thrilling te- television. You know, I love the law. I love the costume design. Like the OCS, they they rock a mean outfit that kind of looks like uh, Daredevil meets Sister Knight from Watchmen. Uh, the performances are really good as well. Uh, there's dramatic heft to the stories. It's quippy. It's quick. It's filled with a mixture of unique uh, costuming and genuinely impressive fight choreography. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, that's only fifty percent of the show. Uh, the other. <laughs> The other half is empty air, surface level, supernatural teen tension yeah. that feels like lock and key. Oh, so, God. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's a 5 out of 10. Love one half of the show, the other half gets 0 out of 10. So it's a 5 out of 5, and a 0 out of 10 overall is a 5 out of 10. Yeah, I, I made it through like one and a half episodes. That was kind of weird. Um, yeah. Yeah, because the moment I hit those empty spots, I was just like, no, no, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, in such a way, uh, the good parts are good, the bad parts are really bad. Mm. So kind of a kind of a meh for me. Like, you can you can skip this if you want. Uh, next up, I'm going to be talking about Brave New World, which is uh, based on a very famous Aldous Huxley uh, dystopian novel, a classic. Mm-hmm. It's uh, airing on a Peacock. It imagines a future where uh, genetic engineering, pill popping, and free love uh, ensure everyone's, uh, that everyone is happy, quote-unquote. Uh, however, when two residents of uh, New London visit quote unquote the savage lands they find that their philosophies are challenged and even threatened uh elder Huxley's dystopian novel brave new world 
one of the one of the best dystopian books ever written. Uh. It's oh, in yeah. the it's in the I guess literary holy trinity along with uh, 1984 and Fahrenheit 451 in terms of uh, classic dystopian law. Uh, so unfortunately, Brave New World in the show is less about philosophy. And more about like slick, sexy sci-fi. <laughs> um, so it's, it's the altered carbon of the of the sci the dystopian sci-fi world. Yes, yeah. Um, it's not high art. Uh, yeah. but it is fun, I guess, in a okay. very soapy way. Uh, once you get through one episode, you find yourself kind of intrigued, but not impressed. But you hmm. find yourself intrigued. Uh, and and a key part of the show's appeal is its cast of compelling characters. Um. Uh, that's brought to life by a really star-studded cast, actually. There's Alden Ehrenreich, there's Harry Lloyd, there's Demi Moore. Um, so without feeling for these folks, you wouldn't get invested in them. Uh, so I guess the, the character work works. Um, the show, however, you know, in terms of the social satire, in terms of the social commentary, uh, yeah, it's not there. At all. It's not there at all. Um, there are though some 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 orgies. So there's that instead. Uh, <laughs> Sure. Let's just yeah. let's just replace any sort of like commentary with orgies. I think that's an acceptable exchange. Yeah. yeah. Um. It it doesn't challenge your brain in the way that Huxley's book did in 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 English class maybe. Uh. But I guess it is a slick, mindless summer diversion. Okay. Like, it once I accepted what it was, I kind of like okay. Yeah. Uh, this all right. Is, this is this is not brave new world, but it is a fun, uh, almost CW esque kind of thing. So five out of ten. Uh, didn't like it, didn't love it at all. But I think you know if you actually tried it, you might enjoy yourself, lah. It's mindless. Interesting. Fun. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, I'll be talking about. Uh, is it my final topic? Yes, it is my final topic. It is called Cursed. It is a new show on Netflix based on the best-selling novel of the same name by Frank Miller. Mm -hmm. Uh, Curse is a retelling of the King Arthur myth told from the point of view of the Lady of the Lake. Uh, the figure who gifted Arthur with the magical sword Excalibur. Uh, it stars 13 Reasons Why, Catherine Langford. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is actually really good in the lead. Uh, but that's kind of where the positives end, unfortunately. Oh, uh, this is a fantasy storytelling at its most bland and insipid. It flounders with dumb romance subplots and baffling decision-making and thinly drawn characters. It it fails in the fundamental aspect of world building in that it doesn't bother to make me in mostly invested in any of this. So why would I care? Um, it is overlong and uninteresting and seems to have a almost a toddler's understanding of politics, yep. uh, making what could have been uh, Game of Thrones-esque intrigue feel like children squabbling on a playground. So it oh, is one out of ten for me. Damn. That, yeah. That's one of the lowest we've given in a long time. In a while, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it's. I've not enjoyed anything Frank Miller has done in a long time. That is and fair. Yes. yes, since the late eighties, if I'm to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while uh, since Frank Miller has done something okay. Uh, I've not read the book. To be fair, uh -huh. I am fairly sure that Frank Miller is not like a prose wizard. No, so I'm, I'm, no. I'm pretty sure the book is not great either. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, I've, uh, it probably has lines like "I'm the Lady of the Lake, bitch," uh, things like that, uh, yeah. So, yeah, they, they, there you go. Uh, that wraps it up for quick hits this month. Uh, finally, though, we will jump jump to pull this. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, very quickly about uh, the return of the Far Side. Um, so, fans of uh, Gary Larson's uh, surreal, bizarre, hilarious comic strip, The Far Side, can rejoice because um, the cartoonist has come out of retirement to publish his first new work in 25 years on his website. Um, Larson retired The Far Side, which was syndicated in about 2,000 daily newspapers mm -hmm. all around the world yeah. uh, 15 years ago, back in 1995, you know, uh, saying that uh, he, he retired it, saying that he feared that if I continue for many more years, my work will begin to suffer, mm -hmm. uh, which is wonderful to hear. I wish more creators would take that, that approach, you know. Uh, however, earlier this month, Larson actually shared uh, three new far side strips alongside a personal essay uh, explaining why he'd come out of retirement. He said that uh, he, him announcing the retirement in 1985 felt good uh, yeah. because he, he had not enjoyed meeting daily deadlines. You know? uh, and 
after moving on to other interests, drawing just wasn't on his to-do list. Mm -hmm. uh, but Larson did explain that he had intermittent connections to cartooning, including drawing you know, a family Christmas card each year and things like that. Uh, so a few years ago, he decided to try to work on uh, a project uh, with a digital tablet rather than for a pen. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, quote unquote, he got one, he fired it up, and lo and behold, uh, something totally unexpected happened. Within moments, I was having fun drawing again. <laughs> um, I was stunned at all the tools the thing offered, all the creative potential it complained. I simply had no idea uh, how far these technological things had evolved. Uh, that's what he wrote. Uh, and thus, you know, he was inspired to revisit his beloved comic strip again. And this is something to be celebrated because uh, not many cartoonists remain from the golden era of newspaper comics. That is uh, true. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the best, and maybe the best ever, has returned. Uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, for far side cartoons gave readers daily offerings from his offbeat uh, <laughs> visions of the world. Um, the thing is, like, not everything, you know, not everything enjoyable when you were young remains yeah. funny or entertaining when you age uh -huh. even if you if you can remember having laughed at it before but sometimes it just you know doesn't age but the far side remains timeless uh and his offbeat non sequitur sense of humor remains as sharp as ever um larson's reference points were not and still are not celebrities or politics you know uh so it never dates you know yeah. he he he's drawing about the mating habits of uh, carnivorous insects and the ridiculousness of dogs or the perverse the perversity of a farmer's cow stools. You know, it's ageless stuff that doesn't date. And it will always put a smile on your face. So um, go check out uh, thefarsight.com, www.thefarsight.com if you want to seek uh, quintessentially absurd cartoons about animals and humans. <laughs> uh, check out the new ones. Uh, then you can spend hours reading the archives of all his old, oh, old cartoons yeah. is all there as well so it's definitely worth it for me though. nice nice definitely gonna be uh, checking that out i haven't i haven't seen it yet nice uh did you read the, the fast set when you were young i did actually every time i looked forward to the comic section specifically uh with knowing that fast side would be one of the things that we will see nice back when print yeah. was a thing <laughs> Back when print was a thing, well, <laughs> print still is a thing. It, it died, it died a slowing, very, died a very slow death, but it's still around. Uh, and I and I guess like Gary Larson has jumped on the digital bandwagon, uh, belatedly, and he has found uh, reinvigorated, reinvigorated interest in cartooning. So, hey, good for him, man. Yeah. Uh, ha happy to see that he's uh he's back at it. Uh, love the far side. Uh, hope to see more of it in the future. Good stuff. Uh, yep, yeah. and. Let's talk a little bit about what we'll be covering next month because it's actually like surprisingly jam packed. Um, Tenant is uh, opening in Singapore on August 26th. Uh -huh. uh, we will catch that a full month and a half before America gets it. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, one of our favorite superhero TV shows, and live action ones at least, uh, is ending its, uh, with its seventh and final season, and we'll be talking about that. Um, Transformers has a new show from Rooster Teeth called War for Cybertron. It's a trilogy of series, uh, and the first six-part series, Siege, uh, premieres uh, in the begin in late this month, in the beginning of next month on Netflix. So we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, speaking of uh, series trilogies, uh, Tales of Arcadia also wraps up its uh, Tales of uh, the Gomo de Toro trilogy. Nice. With its final series, Wizards, which comes out next month as well. Mm -hmm. um, Infinity Train season three comes out next month as well. Um, Doom Patrol ends its second season so I'll be reviewing it on Quick Hits um, The Umbrella Academy uh, I'll be reviewing on Quick Hits season 2 as well um, Lucifer I'll be reviewing on Quick Hits as well <laughs> Agret Ag Gretsuko I'll be reviewing on Quick Hits uh, and a bunch of other indie films like She Dies Tomorrow and Project Power and Smart Dick uh, I'll be talking about on quick hits yep. so that's uh those are the smaller i mean quote unquote smaller topics la. but i mean I, I know a lot of you are big fans of umbrella academy uh doom patrol not so much but i love doom patrol doom. uh there are there are a few things that are um tentative i guess yeah uh, tenet is confirmed mm -hmm. but as of now uh the new mutants um the janelle money time travel film antebellum yep and uh yeah those are the and mulan are still on the website, like on GV and Cathay and things like that. But no confirmed date, right? But no confirm. Like yeah. Warner Brothers and Disney have not confirmed it at all, you know. So if they're on the lineup, 
I will include it in quick hits. If not, we'll take it out. It's fine. You know, there's plenty of other things to talk about. Yeah. Uh, what What are you looking forward to the most uh, next? Uh, uh, I, honestly, I really wanted to see Monet's film, so I'm hoping that's still kind of on the track. Uh, Tenet for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I had, I mean I had mixed feelings about Umbrella Academy, so we'll see mm-hmm. how they it'll do. Be on, it'll, be, it'll be on quick hits, yeah, so, so we don't have if you want to watch again, also yeah. Yeah. Um. Um. Infinity Train Wizards. You know? Yeah, Infinity Train for sure. Um. Mm-hmm. Wizards. Uh, Tales of Arcadia. Uh, I've yep. had so much fun with that. Um. Mm-hmm. Really looking forward to see how they kind of wrap everything up. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess like those are kind of the few standout ones for me at the moment. I mean, as we work through the rest of it, we'll see what what catches my fancy. Definitely. Um, in terms of animation, right? Um, yeah. I'm obviously very much looking forward to Gretsuko and Arcadia and and Infinity Train. But I can tell you that I actually managed to watch the first three episodes of Transformers uh, via for work. Ah. Uh, War for, War for Cybertron. Uh, yes. Siege is very cumbersome title. It is, I think, the best Transformer story we've ever gotten. Like in my opinion, Ooh. I think it. I think it's a banger. This is this is wow. one hell of a show. So like in comparison to the heyday of Transformer animations in our childhood with like mm. I don't know, what would you consider are we talking like classic? Is it comparable to the classic kind of Transformers cartoon? So are we talking about like uh mm, I think it's better. Uh it it has a very fresh new approach on all the characters. Interesting. Okay. Uh there is actual real like full character development with every Transformer that you see. Huh. Like, they feel like real people and, like, when they die, like, you get gut-punched, you know? Wow. Like, these are, these are real things. Uh, like, like, I'm watching Game of Thrones like that, you know? There's a, there's a depth mm-hmm. to the characterization here that isn't anywhere in Michael Bay's films or even in the <laughs> classic uh, Transformers cartoons, yeah. which are great. Yeah. But they don't have, like, mature storytelling like this. Like. Interesting. So maybe, maybe, maybe kids would not enjoy it. Yeah. But, uh, adults will enjoy it and the action is, is visually spectacular as well. Uh. Cool. But but I think all Transformers are visually spectacular. The key is the depth of characterization and I'm I'm eager for you to uh, check it out as well. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. Sure. Let's do that. Sweet. Okay. Uh, till then, though, uh, do, do, do you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, we... No, no. Uh, I mean, we might be doing uh, anime recommendations next month or the month after depending on like whether the schedule clears up. With Correct, all the yeah. studios, uh, we will let you guys know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but for now, that's it from us. That's it uh, from me as well. This has been Hit Zero. This is Lisa. Goodbye, guys. Ciao.